Pastor Donnie showed up to a conference and he was sitting with a friend and after they were having a cup of coffee, he realized that he really doesn't like anybody in his church anymore. <laughs> he started finding all the flaws in his elders, his deacons, the women's ministry leader, like everybody just has major issues. He's ready to just quit because his, he just feels numb. Uh, easily irritated, bringing all the problems home. His wife and he, and he have been thinking about, like, maybe they should go into business. Mm-hmm. Like, she's really good at redecorating homes. He's good at, like, with people. Maybe they should just leave ministry and do something on the side because he doesn't really want to feel numb anymore because feeling numb is really lonely. Mm-hmm. If this is a scenario that describes you as a pastor or your husband, I want you to listen to this episode. Jenny Allen has a lot to say about untangling emotions and why numbness is a gift but why it's not a gift that can be sustained. Yeah. What was uh, the part, Lindley, for you when we talked about numbness that really hit you in our story? Like, did you feel like, okay, we walked through that. We were numb for a while and we needed to get out of that. Yeah, I just, I mean, I actually just liked how she described it in the in the book about when her husband was going through a traumatic health situation, how God gives us the gift of numbness sometimes. Um, I just think that we take it too long oftentimes. Like we... We begin to feel this, and then it goes on for months and months or years of just, you know, I don't care. I don't know, whatever. And so, I mean, I just thought that was a really interesting part. Yes, and and she does a lot of unpacking, like, how you know you're emotionally numb and what to do about it in Mm -hmm. this episode. And just a delightful person, really fun to talk to. So I hope you all enjoy this episode on how to get out of feeling numb in ministry and how to untangle your emotions. Okay, on this episode today, we have someone that our daughter didn't believe we got on the show. I know. She might listen to this one. <laughs> she was like, no way. You didn't get Jenny Allen on the show. Like, yeah, we're that big of a deal. Like, she's now coming on our show. She was like, well, how many downloads do you have? I was like, that's none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> so introduce yourself, Jenny Allen. Tell our listeners who you are. You need no introduction, but there might be somebody oh, out there that doesn't know you. I'm quite certain there's a lot of people out there. My name's Jenny, and... I am in Dallas, Texas. My husband is in business, but we served in ministry. He was a pastor for 12 years hmm. and was a church planter, and that was our life. And then now I am a writer and speaker, and I lead something called If Gathering and Gather 25, which are gatherings of the church, If Gathering for Women and Gather 25 for the entire church, men, women, and children. And that's happening for the first time in 2025. So, you know, just, to, oh, I'm a podcaster too. Yeah. Just a little bit going yep. on. <laughs> There's a lot happening in your life. Yeah, We got four kids. It's, um, it's so fun. They're, they're mostly grown. We're, we're at the end of tail end of parenting full time and they're, they're doing all right. So awesome. It's fun. Well, Jenny, we had a chance to take a little trip to the beach last week, and we read a large portion of Untangle Your Emotions, your new book. Talk a little bit about why you wrote this book. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes it's more fun when it's this way, but sometimes I'm writing books because I'm good at something and I'm teaching everyone about it. That's really rare. Yeah. (laughs) But it has happened. (laughs) There have been those moments. Um, This is not one of those books, and this is more about something that I – needed to grow in and was learning to grow and and it was changing my life yeah i was in a small group of people that included a counselor we were doing kind of a small group um it's called a confessional community where we were got really real about what's going on in our lives we support each other um and process our lives together in a really deep way everyone in the group was a leader and so we had that in common and the pressures that come with that in common and I didn't, I really did it because I love the women in it. I didn't do it necessarily. I mean, I, I knew I needed something. I knew I was not happy at work. I knew I needed to rethink something, but I didn't know what. I didn't know what I needed. I just, I knew that there was some numbness and I was kind of losing my passion for the work I was doing. And so, yeah, I needed that, but I also just really loved the girls. So I show up and yeah, it was pretty transformational what happened there. And I, I'm not someone who's great with feeling my feelings. Um, I don't, I I would rather just have a good time and push it away. 
I have had thoughts and said them many times of what's the point when friends have said, why don't you talk about that? Or why don't you go back and share with us what happened? Um, I will literally say, why? I mean, I, I just genuinely don't know why. Because why relive something that's hard, push forward, Correct. think about heaven, do life, obey God? Why? Why would we do it? And I think I figured out the why. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, well, so... I haven't spoken a lot about this on our show, but I, I kind of hit a wall late part of last year and decided to go into an intensive group experience for five days. I turned in my phone. Nobody knew who I was. I can only tell you my first name. And for the first time in a long time, I had five days of saying out loud how I really feel without well, putting a filter on of what are they going to think about me or what are yeah. they going to think about way. And, um, so I came out of the experience, I came home, went to bed for two days. <laughs> Lindley thought I was right. like, like going to huh. leave and join the circus or something. And, uh, ever since then, Jenny, like, I feel like I've been a different person in learning how to just name my feelings and say out loud how I'm feeling, whether it's true or not, like, this is where I'm at. And that's been a journey for us. Like Lindley, maybe talk for a second about in the book, Jenny talks about how she didn't give people permission mm -hmm. to feel. Mm -hmm. I know for years you felt that way with me, which I can't understand why, because I'm amazing at this. I, yeah, you are amazing. Yeah, I know. Keep going. <laughs> uh, that, I mean, there's not a whole lot to add to that conversation. It is what you're saying. I mean, it's you talked about there's the fixer and the feeler. Yeah. And um, he, I, I'm not an overly feely person, but I do express my feelings pretty easily. I mean, I know when I'm feeling like hurt or lonely or whatever, I'm not as receptive to when other people tell me what I am. Um, so I, it's not that I've got all of life figured out by any means, but um, he is more of a fixer. And so when I would be, when we moved here, it was very traumatizing for me. I lost, I felt like I gave up a lot. And so when I would cry, he would like he'd say, you know, I need you to not, I need you to not cry. I need you. I need you to not do stuff because, like, it was yeah. bringing shame. Like, if I was crying, right. it wasn't that I was just sad. It brought him shame because we right. moved here together, and so Talking my about. feelings affected his feelings. And so, yeah. I mean, talk about you talked about that in your book a little bit. I mean, how did you get there? Was there some sort of family situation that you were like, "Wait, I am not allowing people to feel"? Oh yeah, all my kids would say this was a problem for me that I did exactly what you're saying, Ben. Like I, I just didn't want them because I wasn't comfortable with my own feelings. Yep. I couldn't be comfortable with other people's feelings. Right. And so there was a sense of whenever a friend or a family member was upset, I was immediate, I would immediately move into like, let's, let's fix the problem. Let's, let's solve it. Not realizing that 90% of what was going on wasn't actually the circumstance. It mm -hmm. was actually the bid for a connection. And that they felt alone in their pain. And they didn't need me to rescue their circumstance. They needed me to be present with them in what they were feeling. And so, I mean, the greatest story of this is when my son came home from, I was writing the book and my son came home from school and a girl had said no to his first dance at this new school. And he was a freshman. It was his first time to ask a girl to anything, like really. And I mean, I was... I was furious. I was, he was so down and I was like, we're going to ask another girl and we're going to, you're going to look so good. And shoot, I'm going to teach you to drive. Like, oh, we're going to think of this problem. You're going to be the greatest date ever. And she's going to miss out. <laughs> and the reality was, was he just needed, like, there was no fixing this disappointment. I just needed to be in it with him and be disappointed with him. And let him feel sad with me so he didn't feel alone in the sadness. Yes. Because what we tend to do is when we're trying to fix someone, we're basically saying they're broken. When the reality is that they're actually doing exactly what God, how God built their body to react to disappointment yep. or fear or whatever is happening circumstantially in their life. And so they're actually not broken. <laughs> they're actually experiencing life in the fullest way that God designed mm -hmm. for them to experience it. And so they want what everyone wants. What I want when I'm sad is I want to not feel alone in that. And, and our brains were built in such a way to, to need each other's companionship in suffering 
in fear, in any emotion that you're experiencing, even joy, because it is the place of deepest connection. It's where we actually form relationships. So when the Bible says, mourn with those who mourn, what God knows is that he built our brain to actually heal from mm -hmm. trauma. When someone is just mourning with you, mm -hmm. no circumstances fixed, nothing about your life changes necessarily on the outside, but someone is crying with you and sad with you. And now you are sad together. Yeah. And that sadness together is what begins to heal your brain. Mm -hmm. And that is just scientific. That's not uh, just it feels good. And that helped me. When I understood the science of it, it actually, it changed me because then I, and I understood the Bible. I mean, the Bible calls us to this. Yeah. The Bible calls us to, to experience emotion together, to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and to mourn with those who are mourning. Why? Because there is something that's happening. And Jesus did this. I mean, Jesus knew he was going to heal his friend Lazarus. And if it were me, I would have been so uncomfortable when Martha's mad at him and yelling at him and Mary's bawling her eyes out and I can fix the problem. I would not sit there and entertain these conversations mm. and be present with Great them in their feelings. I would actually come in and, and fix Lazarus because I could, <laughs> but that's not what he did. He actually, he didn't even just, he wasn't even just present with Mary in her, in her disappointment and sadness. He cried with her. That's he good. mourned with her. So there's some value that Jesus understood that I obviously didn't. And in just being with people in their pain. And the more I did the scientific work, the more it helped my very pragmatic brain to understand this is actually living life in a way that brings healing to myself, that brings healing to other people. And it's not fixing them. And the circumstances don't have to change because sometimes they can't. I, I told Angie before this episode started, I really love the space you're in right now in that you're taking a lot of the modern conversation in science and baptizing it. Like you're putting great <laughs> scriptural examples yeah. with it so that Christians don't have to be afraid of good stuff coming out of the scientific world as long as it it coincides with what we believe about yeah. our faith. And it really does intersect well. The example you just gave is perfect. I just think this conversation is so interesting, the timing of it. So per, on a personal note, last night we were up much of the night with our 18 year old son who broke up with a girl he's been dating for 18 months and it's his first experience with heartbreak Brian. and love and he just was so tearful and so sad I mean it's just so hard sure but and our personality I'm so thankful honestly that we've both kind of been dealing in this world of feelings we'd literally just read your book because the tendency is to do exactly what you said, like, I'm going to fix this, like, you're going to be okay, and you're going off to college right. and all these things. And yeah. we both just sat there and held him just and said, him we're cry. so sorry. Oh. And, and it was one of those things where we had been texting a little bit earlier, and I just said, hey, cry it out. Like, God gave us tears like he gave us laughter. I think sometimes we feel like, oh, we can only laugh, but we can't cry like we suppress our tears. And so um, I do think, boys, it's really hard for them to – to feel that and to think it's okay to cry. So, I mean, what you're saying is so interesting. That's so beautiful. Timing right now. Well, you know, I was talking to um, a producer for a show that I was going to be on about this subject and he had read the book and he had a child that was acting out and um, he got the book and I don't think he was a believer, but he read it and he, he just said, I want you to know it shifted everything for me with my son who has just been so difficult for me to parent instead of trying to control him I just started hearing him and I started listening and I started being sorry for when he was sad and disappointed but not you know again we're not talking about um patronizing our kids and we're not talking about giving in to them right we're talking about just letting them feel what they need to feel and and helping them know what to do with those feelings and it, he said, it's unbelievable. It's changed his behavior almost immediately. And I can say as an adult that in the room, they, my group actually, where I learned this the most was when they did what I do to everybody, which was they tried to fix me. And I was saying some things that were uh, frustrating about my work and my life and how I felt like God had abandoned me and just being really raw about my feelings again theologically knowing he doesn't abandon us, right? But 
but saying this is what it feels like. And they all begin to fix my theology. God mm. hasn't, and I, I felt misunderstood. I felt like judged. I felt all of these things. And so then my, you know, the counselor in the room said, I want y'all to start responding. Instead of saying, I think, I want you to say, I feel. Mm. And immediately the room shifted. And I said, I feel misunderstood. I feel judged. I feel, um, I feel hurt. And then they all began to say words like, I feel proud of you for not walking away from God, even though you felt this way. I feel proud of you for um, doing hard work and not quitting. I feel um, empathetic that you felt alone in the work. And, and all of a sudden, my heart just totally softened. And so when I experienced it, when I was on the other side of myself, you know, doing this to my kids and to my friends, I was like, gosh, that doesn't feel good. And so I think sometimes we just don't believe it really does yeah. help, but it really does help. And, and what I think, I think one reason we don't believe it is we, we dismiss our need for connection in the way God built us. And so we don't understand that we cannot do anything alone. We can't do anything alone. And so when we're just not good at it, we weren't built to do it alone. We're yeah. finite creatures. And, and so when we understand that we need each other, even just to go through, and, and I'm not talking about, we would all know and agree if, if we lost a child, we need each other to go through that. I mean, a hard Tuesday, <laughs> <laughs> like we need each other to go through a hard Tuesday and we'll never be there for each other if we keep trying to fix each other. That's really good. I actually called a family meeting for tonight after Tennessee wins the World Series. Yes. Um, She's in Texas. She's in Texas. Sorry. You can't. Oh, my gosh. Well, let's put that aside because otherwise we would be bitter enemies for the rest of the Your show. Your feelings are wrong there. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no. But yes. I, uh, uh, several of our kids are going through really hard mm -hmm. things right now. And I'm like, we just need to sit down and everybody needs to just talk yes. about what they're feeling inside. and. I don't think Lindley and I have a single answer for them, but I feel like we prayed that this summer, it's our last summer, they're going to have all four kids under our roof probably forever. Uh, we prayed for connection. That's been our heart, and we didn't. We thought connection meant like, let's do lots of fun stuff together. <laughs> I think this is a summer where we're going to like really mourn with each other over some things that are going on, and I, the thing about your book, Jenny, I really want you to speak to, because it just so touched me, is the idea that numbness mm -hmm. is a gift. I was going to ask that. Well, you know, I think one thing I prayed as I wrote this book was just that there would be compassion on every page, that people would feel mm. not beat themselves up. I mean, I, I didn't do this great with my kids, but I'm doing better now. And even though they're grown, we talk about it and I've made amends for the, you know, a lot of things I did when they were growing up. I just, I think we can be so hard on ourselves and try to get this right. This isn't something that you can perfectly strike right. Like this is just, this is living and, and feeling is not easily managed in ourselves and other people. And so I think I wanted everyone to feel grace. And when I say numb is a gift is there are times it really serves us. It's actually a feature in our brain that God gave us to go through tragedy when like right now, if you thought to yourself, if my child died in a car wreck, like what would I do? Well, the people I know that have lost children would say the first two days, three days, you're you're not you're not you, you're do dealing with what's in front of you. You're actually dealing with what needs to be done. That is because God built our brain in such a way that that we can turn off our emotions when we need to to survive. Navy SEALs, brain surgeons, like you, you, how does a uh, any surgeon operate on a three-year-old on their brain. Like how, how do you do that? Will you turn off a part of your brain that would feel devastated or overwhelmed or scared and you do the work? So I think there is a gift in that, but what, where it becomes a problem is when you quit using it as a feature and you begin to use it as a way to never have to face mm -hmm. what's really going on. And then we just get into unhealth and what ends up happening in that story. And all of us know in ourselves and other people times this has happened is you just get really agitated and irritated with everyone around you. And so if that's you, if you feel like, gosh, I come home from work and everything bugs me, everything. 
likely you've been suppressing yeah. other feelings that you haven't talked about, that you haven't wanted to admit to yourself or feel. And it always, not always, but often, often comes out as agitation or irritation towards other people. And so, you know, I just, and, and, and through, you know, lots of times just anger. Yes. And, and specifically anger directed at wrong places. Anxiety is another way it comes out. I mean, that was how I started the book was just my daughter was getting married and she was talking, she and her future husband were talking about moving away and doing all these adventures together. And I mean, I was, I was having all but a panic attack at dinner listening to her. I, I, and I knew this was psycho behavior. Like I, I knew I could not say what I was thinking out loud, which is you can never move and you will always live here. And I was like, gosh, I don't want to be that mom. I actually really want my kids to follow God and their, their lives that he's written for them. So I talked to my counselor about it and just tried to sort it out. And the feeling was very similar to a feeling I'd felt a couple years earlier where I was in the hospital and my husband's blood pressure was through the roof. And he, I think it was COVID slash vaccine related. And he was having what could have been a heart attack. Um, and they, you know, there were 10, 15 people in our room when the waiting room was completely full. And, and I'm standing there and thinking I could be losing my husband right now. And it was the same feeling, exact same feeling I would feel at dinner with my daughter just talking about moving. And so when I work through that, and I'm still processing all of that, and I realize, gosh, I, I'm just afraid I'm going to lose everybody. And and I could start to put words to that. Oh, I could cry about this. But even recently, my daughter and I have just had the sweetest conversations around that. And rather than push that feeling away, when we're in a conversation and she might be talking about something they'd love to go do or places they'd love to live someday, I will just say that is a part of me <laughs> is so happy for you and I love it and I can't wait to watch it. And then part of me feels sad because I want to help raise your kids and right. I want to be with you in your life. And I'm able to articulate in a way that she tears up and we tear up together, but we both trust God with her life. And that's good. I just think that's the beauty of it is not that, um, that we do it right or perfectly, or there's some right way to do all this. It's that we're honest and that we're healthy and we're able to have relationships through our emotions rather than push people away because of our emotions. Really good. Mm -hmm. um, in your book, there's a section about the five steps to yeah. identifying emotions. Would you talk to our audience a little bit about that, like how you got to those things? Sure. And, and before I do that, I just want to real quick say, because you're talking to people that are so theologically astute, everybody listening right now knows their Bible pretty well, I bet. And yep. I would just say, you know, I know that there are a lot of times emotions have taken over mm -hmm. and become the God in someone's life, and it has caused such destruction. So I just want to be so clear that when I'm talking about feeling, I think all of us, all three of us, when we're talking about feeling emotions, we are not talking about putting them in the driver's seat of your life. They are not wise drivers, but they are very wise discerners of what's happening. Yeah. They can show you things in your life that are happening, things that you might have gone through or need to process, um, but they are not good at making decisions all the time. So it's like take the information that the emotions give you, but at the end of the day, what I'll share in just a minute is we have to choose what to do with them, that they are not the governors. And what we've seen in the world is that they are the boss of most people's lives. They are how people are making decisions. They're leaving their marriage. They're they're deciding um, to do destructive things because their desires or their heart or their feelings. There's a thing in our house um, where there has been a tendency to say, both of us to say, well, I'm just telling you my honest feelings. And we've really had to change that language to say, I'm telling you my like deepest feelings because I do want to be careful that sometimes our feelings are not the honest truth. Absolutely. So we've Absolutely. had to really change that language to say, hey, these are my authentic feelings. Help me identify if these are the truth. Yes. Um, That's such a humble thing, too, because that then you're allowing people to interact with that. Mm -hmm. Right. Rather than saying my feelings are God and you can't touch it. Right. I, I actually love people. the phrase. I need to tell you where I'm at right now. Yeah. Okay. I may not be at a good place, maybe a dark place, but this yeah. is where I'm at. And like, I had very similar feelings recently of feeling abandoned by God on a certain issue in my life. And I told them, like, I feel very abandoned by God. I've asked for help. I've told him I need help. I'm not getting an answer. And 
uh, I just needed them to know it's where I'm at. I didn't, I didn't want to know theologically that, you know, the doctrine of sovereignty. But I did go there. <laughs> it was helpful. I hey. was, I was like, hey, what if like, there are times where we've abandoned God too? You know, yeah, thank like you I, for that. <laughs> I totally did well, what I was I supposed to do. That, hey, let me say this because I am when when I'm writing this book, I'm pushing back against a wave of the church being afraid of emotions, demonizing emotions, trying to squash emotions. Right. So, I I want to say there is also a time for truth and there is a time to just say, Mm -hmm. but it's, you know, again, it's, it's most of our personalities, most of us in the church learned to say what was true and to fix problems and all of that. But we didn't really get the class on emotional intelligence and health. So, so I, I'm, I'm trying to raise that knowing that to some degree, even with your kids, it's like tonight you may give advice and it may be exactly the right word in the right moment, right? Seasoned with salt and a timely word. <laughs> and so there is that too. But there I think if, if we hold back the part of ourselves that's quick to do that, too quick to speak and not quick to listen, if we hold back that part of ourselves long enough, I think the word will be better received. The word will be more timely. It will be more seasoned with salt because we have heard and felt what the people we love are feeling yeah. and saying. So I think I, I, I do think there's a time for it for sure. Hmm. Well, if you can like real quick, Reader's Digest, give us those five ways to name yeah. your emotions. I think that might help us frame up this conversation a little bit about what do I do when I don't know what to do with all these tangled up emotions? Absolutely. So yeah, I think the tangle is a great thing. You just pull out one string at a time. And the first thing you have to do is notice what you're feeling. And it sounds like, Lindley, that might be easier for you to do these first few steps. Um, so yes. you notice what you feel. And for some of us, it's just not as easy. Correct. And But lots of times you notice it in your body. You might feel your chest getting tight. That's how I notice it these days is my jaw will be tight or clenched. My chest gets tight. Um, and I'll just have to start to ask myself, questions. You know, am I okay? Am I not okay? What's going on? Um, the next thing is to name the feeling. So once you've noticed, you know what, I don't feel okay. I think something's probably bothering me. What am I feeling? And it might be, um, worry. It might be grief. It might be that I feel, um, lonely or disconnected. And so you just begin to put words to it. And then the next thing is to feel it. And to not be afraid of it. And we're going through something really difficult right now in our home and family. And, oh, I just, I cry. I cried last night. I cried the day before that. I, I've cried a lot lately. And it's been so good for me to do that. And I've gotten so much more comfortable with that. And so, you know, you, what it looks like for me is just if I feel like I need to cry, I cry. If I feel like I need to um be alone for a little while. I'll be alone and just feel what it is I'm feeling. The funny thing is you think, gosh, if I open this can of worms, I'm going to sink into the abyss and I'm never going to come out. But the funny thing is it actually is now that I've really cried and cried over the situation that's not changing. Um, I can cry for a little while last night. I was with some friends and shared about cried with them and I feel better. And I'm able to sleep and I'm able to go through my life. It's amazing. You can actually, you, you begin to regulate your emotions mm-hmm. as you begin to feel them and share them. And so the next step is to share them with somebody and you cannot believe how healing this is. We've already shared a lot about that. And the next thing is to choose what to do with it. And for some people, they're going to realize, oh gosh, when they start doing this, I have been angry for years yes. or I have been scared and worried and anxious for years. And you may need to talk to a counselor or to a doctor and to really start to dig into how am I going to get out of this place? My husband, I share a lot about his depression in the book and he needed, he needed help. He needed real help. And when he got that real help, he didn't need it forever, but he needed it to climb out of the pit and, and to be able to even start to process his life and what was going on. So sometimes we need really big help. Sometimes we just need to make a decision, um, around this thing that, you know what, I've let my thoughts, I've had all these negative inputs and I have let my thoughts go into this dark place for too long because of sin or because of choices I've been making. So 
you know, I think there's there's a big array of what gets us in these places. But Chip Dodd's book, Voice of the Heart, I'm sure you probably are familiar so great. with it. So good. He Fantastic. talks about the impaired side of anger. Uh, the healthy side of anger is passion. The impaired side of anger, it really surprised me. This was a game changer for me. I always thought it was rage. But when you're in a really bad place with anger, it's it's depression or apathy, I think. Yes, um, so I went through a really dark season of depression, and it was because I had so many unexpressed things on beneath the surface that I was angry about and never shared them with anybody. Yeah. Um, or maybe I'd share them with Lindley, but I would never have the courage. Steve Cuss told us the hardest thing for a man, particularly to say to another man is you hurt me. Hey. And I'm learning re- recently at 48, I'm about to be 48. Oh, gosh, that's depressing. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, I recently wrote a letter to a guy who hurt me five years ago. And I said, look, I don't need an apology. I don't, I don't need you to do anything about it. I just needed to, you to know, like this really hurt me five years ago when this happened. The moment I hit send on that email, like I felt like 50% healed of the situation. Like I just wow. needed to tell them. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, and I think particularly for pastors, for men, mm-hmm. uh, most most times we get hurt by people in the church and we never go back and say, okay, it's been a couple of years now and I just want to sit down now that I'm healthy around this and say that really hurt. So I, I had two questions about your, the five things, um, but the second one was going to be, and I know you've done a ton of research for this book, sharing it tends to seem like it, women are better than that than men. I don't know yeah. if that's true, but I just wonder about there are so many pastors who are having health issues. Like we've we're actually recording a podcast with coming back after like there's two pastors that have had major health issues. And um, and so I just wondered if you found that to be true. Like, how do we help our pastors our male pastors begin to learn how to share? Like, are there any baby steps that you've learned along the way? Do you even find this to be true? If we are not as the church. And specifically speaking to leaders, and I would say wives of leaders who are also leaders in the church, if we are not in 911 emergency mode right now about the emotional state of leaders, we have a problem because we've got carnage everywhere (laughs) right now. And I believe that it begins on the inside. It begins at the heart. The The choices these pastors are making is a complete obvious result of burnout. You can't, to me, and I know it's sin, right? The fall, there's nothing new under the sun. But, and, and people choose evil and there's no doubt. But why are these leaders so vulnerable to it besides just enemy attack. But how is the enemy doing it? It says that the enemy schemes against us, Mm -hmm. that he's building schemes. We need to take a hard look at this scheme he's building against leaders in the Western church. What is, what is the scheme he's building? Because he keeps running the same play and we're not beating him. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Now a lot of upfronts we are, I mean, there are so many leaders that many, many who are listening they're like, we are fighting the good fight. And like, we are staying faithful over here. Yes, you are. And I feel like I get to see that all the time in my work. Mm-hmm. I see so many leaders that are um, honest about their struggles and in counseling and working through their marriage issues. I see that all the time. But um, yes, this has to be top of mind. And I, I hope that pastors, even in their, you know, fidelity and their good choices that Every leader right now would be saying, how can I be healthier? How can I be stronger? How can I be a better leader? How can I protect in a better way against the enemy's attacks that are coming for me? And and I would say the biggest way is to be honest about what you're feeling, what you're struggling with. I mean, Ben, what an example you've been this whole show, and I'm sure in your podcast all the time, of a man who can say, I struggle with anger. I, I've gotten help. I've done this work. I, I just think – that's got to become the norm in the church. Mm -hmm. And as it does, um, we will become more resilient. We will become leaders who can um, absorb more temptation, more struggle, more um, difficulty, and hopefully even just make better choices. But, you know, I look back over my life and go, gosh, what would I have done without help? What would I have done without a marriage counselor that five years in rebuilt and reformed and reshaped our marriage um, 
they were a believer and they just helped, you yeah. know, and, and I don't know, but, but today my husband and I are madly in love with each other and, um, we have a marriage that people should aspire to. Like we are best friends and we have this marriage, but it's because we have done work to yeah. get there. And really so good. I would just encourage everyone to, to it's time like this, this is an emergency. And if you're a wife and you're listening and you're going, my husband won't get help. Um, I would, you know, I would go get help yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I had to do that right at first. So I just, I told him at year five, I said, listen, I'm going to start going to counseling and I hope you'll come with me because I think we need it. And I think you need it. But if you won't, I'm going to go. And specifically what counseling does for pastors and leaders is it gives you a place where you can actually share things and it not be used against you. Um, and there'd be, a, you know, last house, I get the name. I know why you named it. I don't have to ask you why you named it this way because I lived in it. Um, and so I think paying for a therapist is, is a great way to protect yourself and to feel like I can share. Not mm -hmm. everybody needs a counselor that's paid, but I do think a lot of people in ministry do. I've said this a bunch of times. If I, if God called me back to being a pastor again, or if I could go back and be a pastor again, I would require all my full-time ministry staff to have six weeks of counseling every year for just checkup. Yeah. Just yep. check in with your feelings, oh, how you're feeling. Like it, it, we need more preventative maintenance rather than emergency. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot yes. of the emotions we feel, if we would just process them in real time rather than let them stack up, we'd be such healthier creatures. But in ministry... <laughs> Every Sunday is always coming. There's always something you got to tackle. There's always something that's unorganized right. or in disarray. And we tend to put our own dysfunction and feelings and hurt aside for the sake of other people. And you can only do that so long before your life blows up. That's right. That is right. I mean, I loved um, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. I thought that book yep. uh, years mm -hmm. and years ago was so telling. Like we've got to get our emotional – we will only be a spiritually – mature as we are, um, emotionally mature and gosh, he builds a great point. It's Pete Scazzaro. If you've never read it, I would encourage y'all to read that too. Um, it, it's very convicting on this front. So and yeah, not only that, that it was, the, it was the moment when his wife said, I'm no longer going to church with you. That changed his life. She quit, right? she quit the and church. How many wives have felt that way. <laughs> and so I think sometimes it is the wife that needs to hop off the seesaw That's and let him fall flat on his butt and just say, yep. look, I, I'm not going to continue to live this way. And you, like you, Lindley, are really good at that. I, I have told him before, because we've had seasons here in these five years of like, man, should we go back to the church? We love the church, like the local church. And, and the good news is we get to minister to lots of local churches here. So sure. there's, um, we're not unhappy here, but sometimes he'll say, I'm just going to go back to the local church. And I'm like, I'm not going with you. Because, like, you're not healthy enough right now to go back. <laughs> I'll just go hey, screw up a church. And that is a good wife. Because that, that, that's a thing. And I think it's so good for people to hear that. Because we think, and for so long I thought, just keeping quiet, letting God, praying, and letting God change my husband. That was all I was supposed to do. And I, you were supposed to do that. Let me say that. Like, yes, <laughs> yeah, pray. Yeah, God will change your husband. He's not going to change without prayer and without the Holy Spirit changing him. But also... Be honest, like say what's true. And, and if it is not a safe place to do that, then, then you for sure need help mm -hmm. when you for sure need a counselor. There's no question. There's, that's a, that's a red light. So, um, I think, you know, it's so great. Like my husband and I now are such, um, safe, good friends that we can say anything to each other. We make each other better and still we don't listen to each other all the time. Right. But, but I do believe his voice and my voice to him, it's the most likely to bring change outside of the Holy Spirit. Great. I think that's so interesting you said that because we do get questions like, how do you know when we should start doing counseling? I totally agree with what you just said. If you're, if you have fear of bringing up some of these conversations with the spouse, you, I mean, somebody needs counseling or you need it together. I mean, just for the listener who's listening, because I, I mean, we yeah. hear people are like, how do you know when it's time? Yeah. Jenny, we're almost out of time. You had something you wanted to mention about a gathering. Yeah. So, I mean, we're speaking to church leaders. So I want you all to know about this. In um, 2025, for the first time in history, only because it's never been possible technologically before, um, we are inviting the entire global church to come together for 25 five hours and to worship God together, mm -hmm. to hear the stories of what God is doing on earth in and through the local church. Um, we are going to worship. It is all denominations. It is anyone that says, I love Jesus. We want you to come. And 
it is so fun right now. I was just in Rwanda um, and getting to watch these leaders say, yes, we want to be a part of this across um, different countries in Africa and they're rallying their continent together. And the stories we're going to tell just out of that is going to blow your mind. And so for 25 hours, we are going to live stream through television, radio, internet, everywhere, everywhere we can go, we are going to um, be. And we just want you to gather your people in your town. It's March 1st, 2025. And we just want you to gather in your churches with your people and watch for whatever, however many hours you can, what God is doing on earth and to pray. We're going to pray, we're going to worship, and we're going to commission the church to live out um, the call to reach the ends of the earth by 2033. Um, this is all, this all began with a dream for me where I dreamed that Jesus is coming back. I don't know if he's coming back or not, but I it made me more urgent than I've ever been. And just what would we do if he were coming back in our lifetime? And I think we would we would clarify our, our mission, which is to make sure that the 5.5 billion people that don't know Jesus hear his name and have the opportunity to trust him. And so that's the goal. It'll be fun. And that's every awesome. single person's invited that loves Jesus. Wow. Well, by the time this episode airs, there's going to be a lot of really sad Texas a and fans. So guys, just pray for a <laughs> as they've lost the World Series. Yeah. It, it's a tough call. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you all the best. We are really Thank big you. A&M fans. Actually, Lindley's best friend here is an Aggie, so we hear about it almost daily. Yep. I mean, um, they do love Jesus here, you know? Yeah, they, they wear the ring to show it. So best yep. of luck to you all. Thank you. All right. All right. Jenny, Thank thanks you. for being on the show. The Glass House is executive produced by Angie Elkins, edited and engineered by Donnie Gordon with help from Nathan Howard. Show notes and production help from Nikki Ogden. Photography by Emily Bergeron and Bailey Watley. Recorded at the Lifeway Podcast Studio in Brentwood, Tennessee.